This is our last DCP of Algebra 2. I've already done the review, but I'm going to talk through it. So if you have questions, refer to this video. You can kind of skip around and look at the ones that you need help on. Number one, which expression does not belong with the other three? You're going to have to evaluate each of the expressions to see what they actually equal. Remember our laws of exponents. If we have a set of parentheses with an exponent on the outside, you can distribute that or er, the exponent inside the parentheses. That gives me a to the m over n power. Whenever we have the square roots, remember NBDF. Mr. McGowan taught um, no big deal fam. Another way is numerator in the back, denominator in the front. That's what we're looking for. So the numerator would be the guy in the back, and the denominator is the guy in the front. So I can make this look the same as number A or as letter A. So I know that these two are the same. It must be something different that doesn't belong. Obviously, number or er, choice D also says A to the M over N power. When I look at choice C, when I refer back to my numerator in the back, denominator in the front, my numerator is the guy in the back, which is negative n. And my, num uh, my denominator is the guy in the front, which is m. This gives me an exponent of negative n to the m power. This does not match all of the other ones. Big things to remember here, your laws of exponents. Also, numerator in the back, denominator in the front. Looking at 2, 3, and 4, these are all the same type problems. Um, I'll go over the first one. We have the 8th root of x to the 9th, y to the 8th, and z to the 16th power. Remember how I taught you to do this. 8 goes into 9 one time, so 1 comes out. With 1 left over. Guys left over stay in jail. Secondly, we'll look at the y's. 8 goes into 8 one time, so 1 comes out. There are none left over, so there should not be any y's left in jail. Lastly, 8 goes into 16 twice, so 2 comes out, but there should be none left in jail. There are none left over. Remember, if you're starting with 8th root jail, your answer should also have 8th root jail in it. This is our final answer. Looking at number 3, Cube root of 216. You always want to plug that into your calculator to see if there's an answer. In this case, the cube root of 216 is 6, so it comes out of jail. 3 goes into 9 three times, so 3 comes out. There, there's no one left in jail. That's why there's no jail in my answer. Number four, remember that if you have a root with a fraction in it, you can split them into their own roots. This is helpful because then we can break it down a little easier. Four goes into 12 three times, so y cubed comes out. Four goes into 32 eight times, so z, oh, that should say z, z eighth comes out. Again, with both of these, there's no one left in jail, so there's not a jail left in my answer. Five and six, you should be able to identify this. Uh, the type, it's just talking about, is it a square root or is it a cube root? This is a no-brainer. You should know what squares and cube root looks like. The domain, that's where we're looking left and right. In this case, um, my graph, which you should get off of your calculator, my graph starts at 0, 0, and it only goes to the right side. That means my domain, which is always x, is all the numbers greater than 0, because the extent of my graph is all greater than 0. My y, that's where I'm looking at my range, that's up and down. Again, here's where my graph starts, and the graph is only above 0. So my answer here is y is greater than or equal to 0. Just to drive that point further, the graph never extends below 0. The entire thing is above 0. That's where I get my range. Cube root functions, again, these are easy to identify as they kind of look like an S. Obviously, if you're given the equation, you should be able to point that out, that it's a cube root function. Your domain, again, we're looking left and right. This graph extends forever to the right and forever to the left. That means it's going to touch every single point on the x-axis. The domain is all real numbers. With the range, this graph is going up, although it's not going up very quickly. It does go up, it goes up forever, and it's also going to go down forever. 
our range is all real numbers. Transformations. We've done transformations until we're all blue in the face. Here's how it works. Here's your original equation, the square root of x. They're wanting you to describe the transformation that happened in the second equation. I taught you guys to put arrows under anything that changed from the first equation to the second equation. As you can see, the plus 2 is new and the minus 3 is also new. Things on the inside tell us about going left and right. If it's adding, we're going left. That's where I have left two units. If we have adding or subtracting on the outside of jail, these are things that are moving up and down. This is down three units. Moving to number seven, the things that have changed is the negative out in front and the two. Negatives that are out in front, those are x-axis reflections. An opposite would be the example number nine, a negative that's in jail. Those tell me about y-axis reflections. Negatives are their own transformation. Secondly, with number seven, we've got a two on the inside. Inside means horizontal, and your A is the opposite of what you think it is. So since it's on the inside of jail and not on the outside, like down here, that's how I know it's a horizontal stretch or a shrink. Once I figure out what my A is, in this case it's one half, that number is less than one, which tells me I have a shrink. Um, I'm not going to go over these two. If you have questions on those, please ask me in class. Uh, side note, again, negatives are their own transformations. Be sure you catch that on number eight. Um, number ten, so we're still working with transformations, but this time we're doing it kind of backwards. They're telling us what transformations they want. Let G be a vertical shrink by a factor of one-third. Verticals are what they say they are, so my A is one-third, followed by a translation four units down. Remember, with transformations, you want to do these things in order. If you do not, you will get the wrong answer. Here's the equation that they want us to transform, and the first thing on our list is a vertical shrink. Anything vertical goes out in front of the original equation. Remember that anything that you put out in front must be distributed to anyone behind it. One-third times two is where I got my two-thirds. That's your first step. Step two is four units down. That's where I have the minus four in green. Two-thirds minus four. Plug that into your calculator. Math frac. Your answer is ten-thirds. If you are unfamiliar with that, you can do two-thirds minus four. It'll give you a decimal. The math button. Frac and enter, negative ten-thirds, that's what I have right here. Number eleven, transformations again, reflections in the x-axis followed by a translation two units left. Here's the equation that they want. Doing these steps in order, reflections in the x-axis. Negatives always tell us about reflections. X-axis reflections are out in front. Simple as that, that's all there really is to that, por to that portion. Put a negative out in front to represent the x-axis reflection. The tra um, translation, two units left. Remember, going left and right, we're going to have to add and subtract inside the radical. So when we go left and right, we're looking in jail. We want to go left. Remember that these are a little bit backwards. Left means we are adding, and we're adding two to the inside. Negative one plus two gives me positive one inside the radical. 12 and 13, we did not get a chance to cover these in class, so pay close attention to these. The table shows the number of seconds it takes a dropped object to fall x feet on Saturn. Here's the table. They want us to write a function that models y in terms of x. Um, looking at this, you should notice that your y's are increasing exponentially. They, none of them are going down. They're all going up. So we know just by looking, for, looking at the table that we've got a square root function because remember square root functions increase, 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 increase. That's what we're looking at. So I know I'm going to have the equation y equals a square root of x. What I have to figure out, what is a? This is fairly easy. 
To find a, the equation is y over the square root of x. So I just took a point from my table, this one, plug in my y, my y was 3.5, divided by the square root of x, in this case the x was 10. I just plugged that in my calculator and I got an answer of 1.1. So the equation that I need, y equals 1.1 square root of x. Part B says, how long does it take a dropped object to fall 15 feet on Saturn? Well, 15 feet, that's my x. So I'll plug it in. 1.1 times the square root of 15, 4.2 seconds. Try number 13 on your own. It looks exactly like number 12. And then you can come back and look at what we did. Same thing, my y's are increasing exponentially, so I know that I'm looking at a square root function. My equation, y equals a square root of x, I have to find the a. Remember to find the a, it is y over the square root of x. Pick a point, any point, and plug it in. I use the first one here. y is 200, x is 100, my answer was 20 my equation y equals 20 square roots of x. The next thing, what is the speed of the sound waves in the air when the air temperature is 250 kelvins? Kelvins is temperature, so that's my x, 250, plug it into my equation. All right, looking at our solving our square root fun or our square root equations, we have the square root of 5x plus 1 equals 6. Currently, remember that solving, we're trying to get x by itself, and currently everyone's in jail. So I'm going to have to get rid of this square root first. The way I do that is squaring it. Square roots cancel squares. Remember that whatever you do to one side, you've got to do to the other. This leaves me with 5x plus 1 equals 36. 6 squared is 36. Now I'm try still trying to get x by itself. I'll subtract 1 from both sides. That leaves me with 5x equals 35. Still an attempt to get x by itself. I'm going to have to get rid of my 5, which means I'll have to divide both sides by 5. The 5's on the left side cancel, and I get an answer of 7. Now, with square root equations, it's super important that you plug your answers back in to check it. It will not always work. So what I want to do is take x equals 7 and plug 7 into the original equation. This is my checked work over here. 5 times 7 plus 1 equals 6. That was the original equation. Plugging this into my calculator very carefully, I get the answer of 6. Yes, 6 does equal 6. My answer of 7 is correct. With number 15, same thing. i got to get rid of my square root in order to do that. I'll square it, and whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. Square roots cancel squares. This leaves me with x plus 30 equals x squared. This is a quadratic, and remember, I know this because it has x squared. I also want my x squared to be positive, so I'm going to move these guys over here with him. Remember, any time you move things across the equal sign, you just change their positive negative sign. If he's positive on the left side, when you move him to the right, he'll be negative. Same thing with the 30. Quadratics, you guys know how to solve them with x puzzles. Negative 30 on the top, negative 1 on the bottom. I've got to have two factors that multiply to give me negative 6, but add to... I'm sorry, <laughs> multiply to give me negative 30, but add to negative 1. Those two factors are negative 6 and 5. Remember, those are factors. They are not the answer. From the factors, you can find the answers. Easy way. Again, flip the sign. If the factor was negative 6, the answer is positive. If the factor was positive 5, the answer is negative. These are supposedly the answers. You have to check them both. You're going to have to do that separately. I'll take my 6 and plug it back into the original equation everywhere that there was an x. This is what that will look like. Square root of 6 plus 30 equals 6. 
Solving this, the square root of 6 plus 30 is 6. So that tells me that my answer of 6 is, the correct, is a correct answer. I have to check my negative 5 as well. Again, sometimes the, both of them will work. One of them may work. Neither of them. You have to check them all. Plugging my negative 5 back into the original equation, I have negative 5 plus 30 equals negative 5. When I plug this into my calculator, the answer is positive 5. Positive 5 does not equal negative 5. My only answer to this equation is 6. I'm going to briefly go over number 16 just to remind you that um, the order of operations with all of these is super important. It's PEMDAS backwards, so anything that needs to be added or subtracted should always happen first. Your multiplication and your division happen second. Last things are your exponents and then your parentheses. So when I look at number 16, I'm trying to get x by itself. I've got to get rid of the 4. I could get rid of the 3 halves, but that's not the order of operations. Getting rid of the 4 would be a multiplication or division step, and that's where I should start. Dividing both sides by 4, the 4's on the left cancel. It leaves me with x to the 3 halves power equals 8. I'm going to have to get rid of my exponent next. And remember, if you have fraction exponents, you can cancel them by multiplying by their reciprocal, or the flip version of them. Whatever you do to one side, make sure you do to the other. The exponents on the left side cancel. That's what we wanted. 8 to the 2 thirds power. I plugged into my calculator, and the answer is 4. Again, you have to check these answers. Plugging 4 back into the original problem. 4 times 4 to the 3 halves power is 32. 32 does equal 32. Side note, to cancel a fraction, exponent, multiply by the reciprocal. Same thing goes for number 17. Take a look at that one if you are confused. Number 18. The length in inches of a standard nail can be modeled by this equation, L equals 54 D to the 3 halves power. D is the diameter of the nail. What is the diameter of a standard nail that is 2 inches long? Well, currently, we have an equation for length. We need an equation for the diameter before we can talk about how long the diameter is. So remember that this is these are inverses. Whenever we're going to solve for the other equation, I'm sorry, the other variable. Part one, solve for the other variable. Currently, the length is solved for. I need to get d by itself. Order of operations tell me I need to get rid of my 54 first. I'll divide both sides by 54. My 54s on the right side will cancel, leaving me with l to the 54th power equals d to the 3 halves power. Only look at the purple stuff at this point. I'm going to have to get rid of my 3 halves power. In order to do that, I multiply by the reciprocal of 2 thirds. Whatever I do to one side, I have to do to the other. This allows my exponents to cancel, and L over 54 to the 2 thirds power equals D. Once I have that, the next part is simply plugging in. It says, what is the diameter of a standard nail that is 2 inches long? They're telling me that the length is 2 inches. So part two, I'll use my equation and plug in two. That tells me that D equals 0.11, or if you use math frac, it's one ninth of an inch. Number 19 is simply a science problem. It is a plug it in and go. The function, they give you an equation, models the height in inches using the weight of many small animals. Find the height. This is the equation for height of a rabbit given its weight is 30 ounces. They're giving you the weight. Plug it in. So in place of W, you're going to put 30. 6.5 times the cube root of 30, 20.2 inches. Be very careful. It says round your answer to the nearest tenth. Make sure you do that. Number 20 is much like number 18. A little bit of a shortcut I'm going to show you on this one. In a tsunami, the wave speeds can be modeled by this equation, where d is the depth. Estimate the depth. Well, that's great, but currently it's telling me the speed. On number 18, I told you you would have to solve for d first. That's not entirely true. 
they do give you the wave speed. It's 200 meters. You can use the equation they already give you and plug in 200 meters for your speed. So in purple, you'll see where I'm at. 200 equals the square root of 9.8d. All I need to do is solve for d. Getting rid of my square root, I'll square both sides. Square roots and squares cancel, and 200 squared is 40,000. That equals 9.8d. Getting rid of my 9.8s, I'll divide both sides by 9.8. My answer, 4,081 meters. 21 and 22, finding inverses. To find inverse, we want to switch my x's and my y's. We know that f of x is also known as y. So I'm going to flip-flop the x's and the y's. Second step, solve for y. Easy things first, remember the order of operations, PEMDAS backwards. To get rid of my negative 1, I'll add 1 to both sides. The 1's will cancel. This leaves me with x plus 1 equals 4y. To get rid of the 4, divide both sides by 4. My 4's will cancel and y is left by itself. Remember when we write inverses you have to write them properly. f inverse of x equals x plus 1 over 4. Um, number 22. Same concept, switching your x and y's, solving for y. I get x equals 9y squared whenever I switch the x's and the y's. I'm going to have to get rid of my 9, divide both sides by 9. This leaves me with x over 9 equals y squared. Next, I'm going to have to get rid of the square, so I'll square root both sides. Square roots cancel squares. My answer, the square root of x plus 9. Remember that if you have a fraction under a single radical, you can split them into their own radicals. This was important for this particular problem because the square root of 9 equals 3. Careful with your answer. They're asking for the positive answer only. See how it says x is greater than or equal to 0. Remember, whenever you take the square roots, the answers are always positive or negative. However, this problem is specific to the positive answers. Your answer, positive, square root of x over 3. 23 and 24, it says use the graph to determine whether the inverse of f is a function. Explain your reasoning. To know whether we have or whether or not the inverse is a function or not, we can use the horizontal line test. Drawing a horizontal line in the graph to see how many times it touches the graph. With number 23, anywhere I were I could draw a horizontal line, it would only touch the graph one time. This tells me that the inverse is a function because it passes the horizontal line test. With number 24, if I draw a horizontal line through it, it will touch the graph twice. This tells me that it's not a function because it does not pass the horizontal line test. 25 and 26, determine whether the functions are inverses or not. To determine if two functions, see we've got two, if they are inverses or if they are not, pick one, doesn't matter which one, I guess whichever one seems easier, and find its inverse. So I chose the first one. I'm going to first, to find its inverse, I'm going to switch the x's and the y's. Then I'm solving for y. So again, easy things first, reverse PEMDAS, subtract my 1 from both sides so that the 1's cancel. It leaves me with x minus 1 equals 6y. To get rid of the 6, I'll divide both sides by 6. And my final answer is the uh, f inverse of x equals x minus 1 over 6. This does not match equation number 2. These are not inverses. So if you find the inverse of 1 and it does not match the second equation, they are not inverses. Here are the answers to number 26. Try that one on your own. 27 and 28, use finite differences to determine the degree of the polynomial function that fits the data. Then use technology to find the polynomial function. Well, in order to use our calculator to find the function, we're first going to have to know if it is linear, quadratic, or cubic. And we've done this several times before. We're going to take two points and subtract them 
4 minus 1 gives me 3. The next two points, 10 minus 4 gives me 6. The next two, 20 minus 10 gives me 10, so on and so forth. Remember that you're always subtracting the right one minus the left one. Super important. Right minus left. If you do this one time and they are not the same, you have to do it again. Right minus left. Right minus left. Right minus left. So the second time I did it, again, they are not the same. So the, if the first one, if they were the same, it would have been linear. If they were the same the second time, it would have been quadratic, but they're not. So I have to do it one more time. The last time I did it, I got all the numbers to match. This tells me that it's a cubic function. Again, linear, quadratic, and then cubic. To figure out my equation, stat edit. Calculator. Stat, oh, let me turn this on. Stat, edit, plug in your table. One, two, three. Stat, calc, we said it was cubic. We need our calculator to tell us about the cubic regression. In this case, that's number six. If they had all been the same on the second time you did it, we'd be looking at quadratic regression. If they were the same the first time you did it, we would be looking at linear regression. Keep that in mind. This one's cubic. Have your calculator calculate that for you. Here is your entire, this is the equation in your A, B, C, and D. So plugging that in, <clears throat> ax to the third, my a is 0.16, I plug that in. The b is 0.5x squared, c, 0.33 repeating, x. The d, where it says e to the negative 12, that means this is very, 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 very close to zero, and in fact should be considered zero, so I should leave this off. Your answer, 0.16x cubed plus 0.5x squared plus 0.3x. Here are the answers to number 28. Try that one on your own. Number 29 has the exact same principles. Uh, this says the table shows a person's billable fee in the year T, where T1 corresponds to the year of 2005. Find a polynomial model for the data. Use the model to estimate the fee in 2012. Um, I kind of cheated on this one. I knew what the model was because I looked at my exam or this little cheat sheet over here and it's telling me cubic regression. If I had not had this, I would have had to do my subtracting to figure out what type of regression it was. So just by looking at what was around me, I figured out that it was cubic regression. So I plugged this in and got my equation, just like we did for 27 and 28. Here's your equation. Now the next part says use the model to estimate the fee in 2012. Well, it says t equals 1 corresponds to the year 2005. So I know that this is year 2005, 06, 7, 8, 9, 2010, 2011, and 2012. So for year 2012, my t would equal 8, or my x in this case. Plug it in. Anywhere you see an x, plug in 8. Your answer y equals $217.16. Alright, thanks for watching. If you have any other questions, please stop me in class. Use this to your full advantage. Good luck!